Okay, it is Wednesday afternoon, May 5th, Cinco de Mayo, for all that that matters to a lot. <laughs> um, we are picking up in our Gospel and the Stars. We're not going to go way back for our review. I believe that you've got your foundation set. If you don't, go to the earlier classes and listen and get them, but we'll just quickly review that last week we started looking at our first constellation. That first constellation was Virgo. We thought that that's the right place to start, Virgo representing the virgin birth. This is the first book. The first book talks to us about the Redeemer in his first coming. We see the sufferings of the Messiah in this. We see that the prophecy of the promised seed of the woman is what is going to come out in this description. This is the commencement of all prophecy. Our prophecy started in Bereshit, Genesis chapter 3. It didn't take God long far, did it, in our Bibles to give us our first prophecy. And that was that the seed of the woman, and the woman doesn't have seed, so we're talking miraculous birth. The seed of the woman would be at enmity with, with Satan. The Satan would crush his heel. That's where he touches the earth. We know that was the crucifixion. He might have thought it was a victory, but we know that Messiah rose from the dead and crushes the head of the serpent. And when you crush the head, you're dead. So that's his future. That's this prophecy that we're talking about. It ties in with the prophecy that God gave to Abraham when he said to look at the stars and narrate the story. He talked about the seed that would, uh, would come from Abraham. Shaul Paul in Galatians 3 made it clear that that seed was Yeshua. So we see that, that Abraham, as Yochanan John said, saw the day of the Lord, saw the Lord's day. Let me put it that way. Saw the day that the Lord would be on this earth in human form to be the sacrifice for our sins. This is what he believed in. It was counted to him for righteousness. This is what the virgin Virgo is showing also, that this one who would come from her would be that seed that had been talked about. We saw that she had a branch in her right hand, and we saw that she had some ears of corn or of wheat in her left hand. We saw, um, and by the way, this is the second largest constellation, and its brightest star is twice as large as our sun and 2,300 times brighter. I bring wow. that out just so you begin to get a concept bigger than what our minds are usually containing when we look at the stars and we look at the sky and, and we think. Now the, the branch we saw is Samach. We saw that's the name for Messiah. We saw it in four different places where he's referred to in the Tanakh, in the original or the Old Testament. By that name, we saw all four of those correlated with the four Gospels that we saw the branch showing the Son of God, showing that he's King of Israel, showing that he is the servant, and showing that he is the Son of Man, a very messianic title, capital M on that man. All of these names and these pictures come out of the branch that the Virgin is holding. We also saw that the wheat, the corn, is the first fruits, and we saw how Messiah is the first fruits, and that the first fruits of resurrection, even that he resurrected from the dead because he did, we too can have that newness of life. I think that where we were ending, and we kind of hurried through it, but it's not that complicated. Um, the skirt of the Virgin, the skirt of Virgo, um, it's called Sirma, if I'm saying it right, S Y R. S-Y-R-M-A, and it means the skirt of the virgin's robe, and we realize it is, that's her clothing, and we are clothed in his righteousness, and so we see, you know, even a uh, relation to us in that, that it, it's, he is robing us. Um, we talked about the woman, the way that she is on the elliptical path, it looks like she is lying prostrate, yeah, prostrate, She's fallen. She can't get up. Gives us a reason to laugh at those commercials. But here we see humanity is fallen and cannot raise themselves back up. I'm going to include in that the one called the Virgin Mary because many want to, to deify her. She is not a god. She is not the Lord. She is not sinless. Yes, she was the chosen vessel. And yes, that was an honor and a privilege that, that tells you about her character, but she herself magnified herself in her Lord, who she looked to for her salvation also. 
This also includes Israel. Israel is not without sin. Israel doesn't get away with it just because she's God's chosen people. She needs salvation also. She needs it individually, the same as every individual Gentile. The nation also needs collectively to be right with her God to receive the blessings that will be hers when she does. So that's where we left off, and now we're going to look at each time we look at a major constellation, the 12 of the zodiac, that you're familiar with those names, but we're going to see what they mean biblically. We'll also look to three small constellations that relate to the bigger one that are all part. When they study the virgin, they study these three, they're called decans, D-E-C-A-N. And if you want to say decan, I'm, I'll tell you pecan, pecan, <laughs> okay? <laughs> I say decan, <laughs> all right? Um, but there's always three that go with the major one. They're like three minor points, I would say, underneath, and uh, they give us that fuller picture. So with Virgo, the first decan, the first smaller constellation, is called comma but it's spelled C-O-M-A. You just leave out one of the M's. And comma is the desire of all nations. When you look at the description, and Roger, can you put the, the um, map up? Yes, and for those of you who still don't have maps, I'm struggling because I've been told what went out wasn't good quality, so I'm trying to work on something better. Hopefully we'll catch up. Okay. Um, I should have cued Roger in ahead of time, and I didn't, but if you go right in from to the inside from Virgo, um, you're going to see, yeah, go, now go just to my left, your right, right there, perfect. Circle that, that's what we're talking about. He's making it real big. There we go, good, good, good. Now you can see it well. It looks like a woman sitting there, and like she has a child actually on her hand, but it's supposed to be the, the child on her lap. Okay, and underneath, I can read on mine right now, C-O-M-A, comma. That's the one we're talking about, okay? And see how close she is to Virgo? So that's why they, they take and they, remember, they draw the pictures to help us understand. But you could draw a different picture if you want. But it's interesting, the pictures that they do draw and how they relate to our scriptures. The woman in this picture is nourishing. She's holding the infant child on her lap. Um, again, we're not talking like how you would hold a baby, <laughs> bless <laughs> you, <laughs> but we are talking, you know, in general here. It looks like she's holding her mother's hand. Yeah, it looks like she's playing, oh, oh, you she, know. What's she called? Uh, comma. 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 C-A-M-C-O-M-A. Like the comma in a, in a sentence, C only that's spelled with two M's. Yeah, yeah. Somewhere along the line, I'll try to get out... Um, the major names, the minor names, and like maybe a one-word description, and then I can get that out to you all too. That would help. So I'll, I'll try to do that sooner rather than later. Um, no promises in the next week or two because of my schedule, but as soon as I can. But this reminds us when we see this woman taking care of this child, nourishing this child, it reminds us of Luke chapter 2 and verse 40. Luke chapter 2 reminds us we had a baby born. What did you say, Luke? Luke. 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 40. I'm sorry, yeah. I need to be clear. Luke chapter 2 uh -huh, and verse 40. Okay, in <coughs> Luke 2 and verse 40, it tells us now the child continued to grow and become strong, increasing in wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. I think sometimes we forget we go from the baby to 30 years old to the ministry. There was 30 years in between there. He grew up. Of course, we do have stops at certain points, like when he was 12 and in the temple. But the idea is we're seeing that Virgo is the mother that's nourishing this child. It shows also, because of the relation to Virgo, it shows that the branch or the woman's seed will be a child. Okay, the branch that she has that, that we talked about, that's a picture of Messiah. This branch now in her hand is not a branch, it's a child. It's showing us the branch comes as a child. And that's why I think it's been given the name, um, the desire of all nations, because, the, and that's the ancient Hebrew. The ancient Hebrew is actually the desired or the longed for. That, let's look at Haggai. In the original covenant, Haggai chapter uh, 2 and verse 6. And see what that says. 
How's Haggai spelled? Haggai, H-A-G-G-A-I. I don't know how they get Haggai out of that because they do the, the um, vowels backwards, but that's what they say. In Hebrew, it's Haggai. Okay, and verse 6 tells us of chapter 2, For this is what the Lord of armies, the Lord, the Adnai Savaot, what he says, Once more in a little while I'm going to shake the heavens and the earth, the sea also, and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, they will come with the wealth of the nations, and I will fill the house with glory. Now, you can't see it in that, but in the second verse, I will shake all the nations, and they will come with the wealth of the nations. When you get into the original language, it talks about that desire, that this is the desire of all nations. The nations are, are hoping to come into this, um, which we know is Messiah. They don't realize um, they, they, they called it wealth here, I think it said. They will come with the wealth of all nations. Mm -hmm. What it really should be saying, this other version says the treasure of all nations. That's yeah. where Haggai, two. chapter 2 and verses yes. 6 and 7. Okay. But you may have wealth of all the nations. You may have treasures of all the nations. What's the wealth? What's the treasure? If you go back in the root, it's the desired, the longed for. Well, what is this desire? What's longed for? We cry out now. We're longing for the return of Messiah. Originally, they were longing for the coming of Messiah. So they were, they were looking for that first coming, and those who miss the first coming are still looking for a first coming. So this is the longed for. This is the desire. Even in the ancient Egyptian um, zodiac that's been discovered that they say is at least 2000 B.C., even in that... They called this the desired sun. So they realize there's a desire of the sun to come. We know it was when what God promised. A child would be born, the sun would be given. Some nations went so far in their in in, in what they found in the archaeological archaeological <laughs> ruins. Some um, nations called the sun and it looks in our English like I-H-E-S-U. And there are those that believe that that was the precursor to what we call Yeshua today. Now, whether that's true or not, I can't tell you because I don't know how the language morphed. It, to me, it seems like we're looking at a finish and working backwards. But I bring it out to you because it was interesting. We do know that the desired son is Yeshua. We know in the Greek that's Christos. We know Hebrew is Mashiach or Yeshua. Yeshua being Jesus, Mashiach meaning anointed one. That's the, the actually Jesus is his name. Messiah is his position. His, his, what he's, his, I, I can't call occupation, position. I'll stick with that for right now. Okay, so this little constellation that we looked at, Kama, has 43 stars. And traditionally, they say, and that means tradition. That means we don't have scripture and verse to 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 quote you, but it certainly fits with Chris, with um, scripture because they say in tradition that the prophecy in the east was that a new star would appear in this sign when he whom it foretold would be born. Okay, so in other words, when the promised the longed for, the desired, when this one this was born as a baby, they would know it because a new star would, would show up in this constellation. Now we know a star showed up. We know the Magi, those, the kings of the east came looking, following his star, for we've seen his star, we've come to worship him. So something did show up. It's, again though, this is just tradition that was passed down that they told us that. But where do we get this in scripture that I say that, that a star will be representative of him? Okay, go to Numbers, Bed Midbar, go to Numbers chapter 24 and verse 17. I think I read this last week to you also. There will be a number of times we'll probably refer to it. Numbers 24, 17 was prophetic, speaking, looking to the future, says, I see him. I see the desired one. I see the long for one, but not now. That means I'm looking down through the future the same way I'm saying I see the coming of Messiah in his second coming. 
I so fully believe it. I can see heavens open up. I can see him coming out. I can see the armies with him. That's us. I can see him coming down. I can see him slaying the enemy. And I can see him setting up his kingdom. Now, has any of that happened? No. So this is how they were looking at this. They saw it and they took it for gold. This is it. I see him. I see him, but not now. I look at him, but it's not near. It's going to be a while, and boy, were they right. A star shall appear from Jacob. And Jacob is regarding, is, is a reference to Israel. Okay, so a star shall appear from Israel. A scepter shall rise from Israel. The scepter being this, the one who we're seeing, whose star is going to rise. The one that we're longing for is the one who will hold the scepter. The one who holds the scepter is the king. Remember when the king held out the scepter to Esther and she was allowed to speak to him? Had he not put out the scepter to her, she would have been killed because she would have come improperly to the king. So this is showing, and it goes on and says he'll smash the forehead of Moab. That's the enemy at that time. But it's showing that this one that they're looking for to come is going to be their savior, their rescuer. And this one is represented by a star appearing from Jacob, in particular from Israel, or in more general from Israel. Now, how would the kings of the east know this? Remember, we go back to Daniel, to Daniel being there. If he taught them well, and I believe that he would, he could have easily given them this scripture because he would have known this, being a good student of his Hebrew upbringing and we know he was because he knew to stay kosher and we, we know he had the wisdom of God so we know he was a student of, of um, the scriptures that they had at that time so it probably would be through him passing that down it's very likely that there would be a new star that would appear and probably in this area now this gets technical, and if you ask me to explain it where you understand it fully, I'll tell you, well, I'll give you my books, and I'll let you read and see if you got a better brain than me. <laughs> okay? There are a few times in this study that I just kind of shake my head and say, okay, God, either you got to open up and do a miracle up here, or I'm going to just hold on by my, <laughs> by my fingernails. They talk about the latitude and the longitude, okay? Latitude and longitude. Now, I understand that in geography on our earth, no problem, okay? But they talk about the latitude giving breath, and they say that the angular distance of a celestial body, okay, celestial body, your stars, you know, whatever, the angular distance from the ecliptic path equals the longitude. Now, how you went from latitude to longitude is where I lose it. But somehow they're able to, the same way you look at a map and you, like it's Y4 on a map and you go over to Y and you come down and four's over here and you say, aha, this is where, okay? They do that with the latitude and the longitude. And they, they say that a new star would show the latitude every, it would be overhead at midnight every night when they were looking at that part of the sky. They would see it at the highest point in their sky at midnight, and that that would be the star when it rises like that in that latitude and longitude, I guess that, that mit, mit, meets comet, that then they would know that's the star. Because how else? There could be other new stars. That's how they would know it was his star. Okay? Mm -hmm. We do know his stars in relation to something that's going to relate to him. <clears throat> so very easily it could be in this constellation that's speaking of his birth, if it's with them coming because they knew he had been born. That means they knew he was a child. They didn't come looking for the adult king. They did go to the palace because where was, where should the king be? But they they did come looking for the child. Okay? Hopefully I made that clear. We're, like I said, there are a few times I'm just going to say, just hold on. <laughs> okay? And by the way, his star, them, them saying we've seen his star, that's Matthew 2.2. 2. I will also tell you, there is a lot, even though this is a fascinating study and I fully believe in it and I will give you everything I can scripturally sound, there are a lot of theories and ideas out there that don't all correlate. One gets all excited and says, oh, I see this, here's this, and another one comes along and says, oh, nope, you missed that scientific fact or you missed this scientific fact. So it's not so gelled in concrete that, that we can give it black and white all the way through. 
Um, so some will say, well, that star couldn't have raised in that point, you know, this sort of thing. I'll stick as close to the scripture as I can and give you what I get that relates to that. So here's one of the ideas that this could be also, this new star that rose. The year preceding Messiah's birth, and they think they know when he was born, but again, you'll have the different theories out there. But the year before his birth that's, that, that we're accepting, that we think is right, there were three conjunctions of the planets Jupiter and Saturn. Now we know, we're smart, we're educated. We know that Jupiter's a planet and we know that Saturn's a planet and we know the two of them are, are separate. With our telescopes, we see the separation. But if you look even with the naked eye when they tell you on the news that, that they're close, it looks like one. It comes together, it looks like one. Because of that, it's brighter because they're both giving their light. And remember how bright some of these are? So they say it happened three times that Jupiter and Saturn came together at the end of May, at the end of October, and the beginning of December. And they say that it occurred in the sign called Pisces that we'll get to later. Pisces, we know, is in relation to Israel, okay? That constellation we know is in relation, it has special reference to Israel. When we go through, you'll see when we get to Pisces. So they're saying that meant that there was a favorable event coming to Israel. And they tie that in, believing that to be the star that was seen, that it may have been the conjunction of these two planets. Now, as soon as I say that, if you pick up a different book from the author that I'm reading, they'll say, no, that couldn't be, it wouldn't have been special, it would have been something normal, it couldn't, it couldn't fit. So here's where we do have some of just man's opinion, and we can only, when we get home, I want to find out, okay? <laughs> um, but as I go into the detail of the names and the meaning with the names, and we look at what they, they stand for in general, we see the gospel clearly given. It's just some of the little details. It would be like, I can't say to you exactly what year he was born, but I know he was born. Because we don't know exactly that, we, we look at other dates in his life, and they're all, you know, if you say he was born, we know he was born B.C. He was born before himself, <laughs> okay? Because the calendar is off, and everybody agrees with that. So he was born anywhere from as late as, how do I say this the right way? Between 2 B.C. and 6 B.C. he was born. There are good theories at six, at four, and at two, <laughs> okay? And that's why something like that, I can't give you dogmatically, but can I give you dogmatically that he was born, that he was the son of God, that he came from heaven and came into human form, and he did it in the perfect timing, because the scripture tells us he came in the fullness of time. Absolutely, every single one of you will agree with me. So. We can see things that happen in the sky at 6 BC that could fit this, this scenario. We can see things that happened at 4. We can see things that happened at 2. So you can't nail it down and say, oh, on the basis of the stars, we know for a fact it's this date. Okay? Do you all understand? Because I always want to make it clear where I can't be, you know. Here is, if, if Luke 2 had said, in the year of... <laughs> Miriam and Yosef came down to Bethlehem and Yeshua was born, then I'd tell you in the year of, okay? We do have historical fact to help us. We know from the government and the years, you know, what year Cyrus was governor. But again, there's controversy in the historical figures also. Like somebody said, when you're talking about 6,000 years, you got to give or take a, day, a year or two. You know? <laughs> so we don't let this throw our faith because everything that we need nailed down is in the Word of God. The rest is very interesting. It may add some more color or some more depth. When we go into, there are a few aha moments in this study already. There's one that I just lost it all over the place, and I don't know when I finally came down to earth and stopped just going, Wow, God, you are so amazing. <laughs> and just oozing all of that out. That, that will come. No worries. I just want you to realize because um, I don't want you to hear something later and say, well, Rochelle's not trustworthy because this one is, is excellent saying this and this one's excellent saying this. Well, they're smarter than I am and they can't agree. <laughs> so, 
Anyway, tradition goes on and tells us there was the star. It rose. It was on that latitude that gave them the longitude that sent them on their way. They were coming on their way to Bethlehem from Jerusalem. They'd been to the palace. They'd been told, oh, it happened in Bethlehem. So they're headed for Bethlehem. And you've got to keep in mind this is tradition, okay? <laughs> They stopped at a well to refresh themselves. This is probably um, the, the well that, that's known in Bethlehem. That all fits. But they're saying that, you know, they were having some trouble following the star to the very location. And that's why they went to the palace and asked the, the, King Herod, where's the king of the Jews, you know, that was born? It, they are saying that when they went to get the water out of the well, it reflected the stars. We've all seen that. A, a lake at night reflects the stars. That they were able to see in that reflection and enough definition, it guided them to where in Bethlehem to go. Now, again, I do know they followed the star and they came to the house where the young child was. I say that because if you're still putting the, the kings of the east at the stable at... The, at when Yeshua Jesus was a few days old, you're missing it. <laughs> it took time for them to come. It took time for them to come down to Bethlehem. It took time for them to leave and go on their way back home. We don't know how long scripture doesn't tell us, but when Herod realized they weren't going to come back and tell him where this baby was that he, quote, wanted to worship it, we know he wanted to kill, mm -hmm. we, we, hi girls. <laughs> We've got uh, Rowena's grandchildren, Cameron and Charlotte there, <laughs> waving at us. I had to welcome them. Anyway, we know that, that Herod put out the net to kill the, the male babies two years and under. If the wise men had come and saw the baby when he was a few days old and had left in a week or two, there would be no need to slaughter babies from two years of age and under. They, you know, he could easily say all infants, all under a year, you know, whatever. So the fact he went for two years tells us there's time in here. And because of that, again, we can't pin it down exactly and say, okay, it's this star at this time. But we do know there was a phenomenon in the skies that did reveal. The same way the shepherds saw in the skies, the angelic that told the story, the same way that we'll continue to see far more and, uh, and I want to even go on and just get you to some of the good stuff. Let me give you testimony from, um, I'm going to call them believers. When I say believers, they believed in Messiah, okay? And they wrote, Ignatius was the bishop of Antioch in AD 69, and he wrote, and I quote, At the appearance of the Lord, so when the Lord appeared, a star shone forth brighter than all the other stars. My point is saying this is in 69 AD which means there was people who could have still been alive easily. It, at most, it was the parents telling the children. It's being recorded in historical books that some sort of star shone brighter than all the others. Something stood out. Prudentius continues. He's in the 4th century AD. He's a Roman poet, and he said in his poetry, not even the morning star was so fair. So again, passed down, that's why we say tradition, was that there was a bright and beautiful star. Now, here's my question. I don't question at all whether there was a star that shone in some way back then. I fully believe there was. I don't know if we have it exactly or if we're just close. But let me take you, that's his first coming. Let me take you to his second coming. Let me take you to Matthew 24. You know that chapter well if you've been with me for a while. <laughs> I see the head shaking, yes. And let me take you to verses 29 and 30. Just to set the stage with 29 and 30 is my verse for point. 29 says, immediately after the tribulation of those days, and it doesn't mean in, in our English it sounds like the tribulation's over and then this immediately follows. That's not the way it means from the Greek. It, it means that out of the, these tribulation... The chapter. 24, Matthew 24. Out of these tribulation um, scenarios, not scenarios, they're real facts. Out of the, these experiences, this is what happened. The, the, um, those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will not give its light, and the stars will fall from the sky. 
that when you were with me in Revelation, we talked about all those happening very close to the time of his second coming. We're at verse 29. Matthew 24, verse 29. We're soon to be headed into <clears throat> verse 30. Okay, so Matthew 24, taken in order from verse 3 all the way down, by the time we get to 29, we know we've moved through the tribulation, the very end of the tribulation, and that's when the stars are falling from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, I laid down the groundwork very well for all of these to be not just for light, sun, and moon, light, and dark, but for them to be signs also. We talked about that signifying something about the one who is coming. So now, knowing those are to be signs, verse 30, then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Now, most of us, as we've taught, just jump on that and say they're seeing the, the Son of Man coming in the, the, in the sky in his return. And I'm still saying that. I'm not disagreeing with that. But I think I've missed one little detail. It's not just that the, that the Son of Man appears in the sky, but the sign of the Son of Man appears in the sky. Will there be this star again? Will there be some sort? And I don't think it'll come and be given you know, time and all of that, but it does make me wonder, will there be some sort of a brilliant star at the same time that he is appearing of course, it would be dimmed by his appearance. See, I'm thinking all this through while I'm talking with you. But it, but why does it say the sign of the Son of Man? I think I think there must be something there. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. All the tribes of the earth will mourn. They will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky in power and great glory. So the clouds could be the cloud of witnesses. They could be literal clouds. They could be both. We've got evidence in the this the sky of his coming, we're told it'll be like lightning that flashes from the east to the west. You see it from one end of the sky to another. If you've ever been in a, in a big electrical storm, you know what I'm talking about. But I wonder if there also, you know, the stars have been falling. Is there his star that's rising again that we're seeing at the same time? Just food for thought. I'm not saying it's fact. I'm just saying it's interesting. The significance of the sun, moon, and stars is here and the word sign is here. There was a star at his first coming, there could be a star at his second coming. And keep in mind, when he returns, it's not going to take him 24 hours to return. It's not that he's gonna be on this slow elevator coming down from heaven to earth, which means it's gonna be night somewhere. You know, we all think, oh, it's gonna be day when he comes. Well, he's gonna light up like day. And we know that he's returning to Israel. He's not returning to San Bernardino skies. He's returning to Israel. But somewhere it will be dark. It will be night when he's returning to Israel. Is our star showing, reflecting his glory? Well, it would have to be night so that we can see the star shining, right? It, to see the, if it is a star that's shining, yes. For those who see that, yes. But whereas light, they're still going to see, well, and even and see, here's where my theory begins to fall apart. He's so, his glory is so bright that if that's going to dull the sun, that's going to dull the moon, that's going to dull the stars. I don't know. I don't it know. It could be any time of the day. Yeah, and it will be, it will stand out of the sky, you know, so regardless. But anyway. I'll, I'll let you work on that. I'll keep working on it. If any of us come up with something worth sharing with the class another time, we'll bring it back up, okay? So, we've looked at our first, our, our woman with a child called Kama. We've looked at our first little decon. Our second decon is called Centaurus. C-E-N-T-A-U T-A-U R U S. 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 I should get a whiteboard. Next week we'll try that behind us, Roger. C E N T A U R U S. Centaurus. Okay? Um, it's also known as the centaur, which just take the U.S. off the end. Okay? It depicts the God man. So, Roger, I'm going to ask you to call up our map again. 
and we're going to look close to where the child was. I should have warned you ahead. I, I could have done so much better. I will get better at this, everybody. Okay, look, look, that's booties. We're going to want booties next, I think. I've studied further ahead, so I don't Is remember. that the man with the sickle? It should be, yes. Okay. Yeah, they're, they're there. Is that? No, 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 no. It's going to be one of the smaller ones. Um, there he is. Nope, that's booties. That booties has the sickle. Sorry, sorry, um, nope. Dora. Oh, okay. Let me borrow it back, Anne, because I, I'm sorry. And I, I'm studying ahead is why I can't remember. What about the sickle? Hmm? Not the guy with the sickle? No, because that's called booties. We okay. want centaurs. It's real close in there. Real close in there, and I need my magnifier. There's a guy with a club. Okay, okay. He's going to be half man and half horse. Look for a half man, oh, half horse. Oh, half man and half horse. Is that the one outside the circle then? Yeah. Oh, no. You know, was he? Yes, he was. Thank you. That's my problem. That's my problem. I've studied so many of these. Go outside the circle, the oh, other oh, side of Virgo. Half man, half horse is way down yes. The yes. He's way down that. There you go. He's You're on it right yeah. now. Thank you, Dora. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. No, you you got it. Yeah. yeah, and shrink a little, shrink yeah. a little. Okay, see the name Centaurus right yeah, below now. <laughs> no, don't. You're making me dizzy. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was a, doesn't want to do that. Okay. Yeah, come over a little. We got to see just wait, a little wait, wait, bit. Wait. Oh, you can get. Okay, that did it. Good. Okay, that's Centaurus. Okay, he's the god man. He's the figure of a being with two natures. He's half man and he's half horse. Okay. He's made up of 35 stars. His Hebrew name is Beza, B-E-Z-E-H, and that means the despised. Okay? Now, if you're ahead of me, as soon as I said dual nature, God, man, you're thinking our Yeshua Jesus was fully man, 100% human, 100% divine at the same time. He is the God, man. Okay, this is the closest that they're getting to how they want to depict it in, in the sky. Okay, two natures. One, the, the name in Hebrew given to this is the despised. Does that sound like Isaiah 53? And I believe it's in, in particular verse 3. It's either 3 or 4. It's 3. He, and Isaiah 53, Yeshia 53, we know very clearly, um, even when our rabbis try to say it speaks of Israel, you try to put a nation in there, and when the nation did these things, and it says, and it doesn't fit. But if you follow Yeshua Jesus' life, you will see how it fits in, to the point that, that many have said, this is a Messianic prophecy, and they're not yet believers, and they've said it. Okay, so... He was despised and abandoned by men. That's Isaiah 53, 3. And the name of this in our Hebrew, the name is the despised. So I think so we... Was despised. See, the despised. Despised. Okay. Yes. Yes. Okay. The brightest star is in the horse's forefoot. And I'm not going to spell all the names because, trust me, the names get even worse. But I'll try to pronounce it as best I can. Ptolemon. And that name means the heretofore and the hereafter, okay? Or in other words, how we're used to phrasing it, the one which is, okay, the one which was, which is, and which is to come, okay? The heretofore and the hereafter, was before and will be after is what we're seeing. So we've got a dual nature, a God-man who was despised, who is of the character that he was of the past and is will be in the future. Do we not have a good picture of Yeshua Jesus, of our Messiah, just out of this description and these names? And then listen to this. That star is given that name because it fades and then it becomes brighter. And when we see that, we see Yeshua's glory faded hidden in his first coming, his humility, and when he comes back in his glory, it's revealed glorious. So it fits with a star that fades and then becomes very bright. So very interesting what the star does, the name and the meaning. There's another Hebrew name for this constellation. 
This other Hebrew name is Asmeth, A-S-M-E-A-T-H. Again, I don't know if I'm saying it right. Um, in fact, I'm sure I'm not because the Hebrew won't have the H sound on the end. But anyway, that literally means sin offering. This is the name given, the ancient name given in the Hebrew. And we think of Isaiah 53 and verse 10. But the Lord desired to crush him, causing him grief. If he renders him, himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring, he will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. So it's telling us that God is going to crush this son. We know that, that in essence, even though man will say he put Yeshua Jesus to death, it was God that, that enabled it to happen because man's not more powerful than God is what I'm trying to say. So when we see sin offering, we see, uh, and this said guilt offering, the same thing here in this case. What we're seeing is God allowed him to become the sin offering to die for us that he could redeem us from our punishment of sin, which is death. So it fits very well with this Hebrew name being a sin offering. We'll see other times when he's referred to as a sin offering also. Now, if I remembered my description, we would have found it so fast on the map because it is the lowest of the constellations, it's the farthest south from the northern center, and if you go back to it real quick, Roger, it is situated immediately over the cross. Okay, so we're going to see, there we go, see the cross right under it? That's speaking of his death, that he would die on the cross. So we see that. The Greek name for Centaurus is, an I'm going to try Chiron. It's the he, which we do see H in our English because there's no other way to put it from the Greek, E-I-R-O-N. And that from the Greek means who pierces. Notice he has a spear, notice he's piercing, okay? The Hebrew root of that Greek word when, when it's translated into Hebrew also means pierce. His sword is piercing the enemy. His death destroys our enemy. Our enemy of sin is death. He took that for us that we can live. So um, when we take it into mythology, because remember how mythology and the astrology and all that comes out of all this. In mythology, this name, Chiron, Chiron, however you say it, he was renowned for his skill in hunting, for his medicinal abilities, for his music, athletics, and for prophecy. He was quite a person in mythology. His greatest, uh, or the greatest heroes that you read, like Hercules and you know the, the great heroes, were his pupils. He trained them and they were great heroes. So it's showing he's like the hero of the heroes, okay? He was immortal, but he voluntarily gave up his immortality. He agreed to die when he was wounded by a poison arrow, and he transferred his immortality to Prometheus. Prometheus, these Greek words. Another, another, yeah, thank you, Roger. Another um, Greek god, and god with a little g, you know. Uh, but what do we see in that? You see how Satan is taking what Yeshua Jesus did. He gave up his immortality when he put on human form and died in his human form. Did God die? No. <laughs> nothing can be further th from the truth God cannot die he always was, always is, always will be he breathed into man man became a living soul we, we know that, that God did not die <clears throat> what died on the cross was the human shell the human flesh is what died why did it die? because the punishment of human sin is human death it's not the death of God. That would make God less than. And, and you, I mean, you can't, God's in control of everything. You can't have, you can't, it just doesn't make any sense, and it's not what's being said. But Satan takes, and he twists that. Now he takes, and he puts into mythology and into the, the studies that here's this immortal one who chose to give his life for others. The big difference is in our true story, Yeshua Jesus raises from the dead. He conquers death. He doesn't just pay the price. He conquers it. He, he redeems us from it. 
and in Greek mythology, this other one is death. That he had, he was known as a teacher, he was known as a healer, he had knowledge and skill far beyond any others. You can see how, how he was made out to be like Messiah, like Yeshua Jesus. But they didn't get the end right because they're twerking it, twisting it. Okay, but a very interesting um, picture that we have here, and we'll later talk more about the um, victim, the lupus, but that comes under another one of the stars um, signs. If I remember right, I think it comes under Libra, so it won't be long before we are talking about it, but Centaurus is separate. His arrow is going to the victim, to the lupus, but his, they're separate. They're two separate constellations or decons. Okay, so now we've seen Comet the woman with the child on her lap. Now we've seen Centaurus, this God-man, half, half man, but half is horse. He is he kind of good and evil? In mythology, it sounds like he's good, except he dies. Oh, he dies. Yeah, he dies and he gives up his immortality so someone else can live. Well, the Lord gave up his human life that we might live, but the difference is the Lord raised from the dead. Yeah, that's the well, difference. If Christ died, but it didn't raise. Right, right. Yeah. Okay, our third one is booties. That's the one. Um, his arrow was pointing right at it. No, no, no. Go down. Go down. Don't. There you go. Now put your arrow back where you had it a second ago. The sickle, remember, in the hand, mm. right there. Your, your oh, almost, There you go. Right there. That's booties. I was making okay. arrow. Oh. Booties. B o o t e s. Okay. If you want to pronounce them different, be my guest. <laughs> you got booties on. <laughs> you got booties on, okay. All right, this is who we're talking about now. It's 54 stars that make up this constellation or this decon, and th this means the coming one. Okay, remember we're in that first book that is talking about the Redeemer, his first coming. This name means the coming one. He is pictured, and it's a little hard to tell, but if you keep thinking about when you, as I describe it to you, He's pictured as a man walking rapidly. That's what he's doing there. He's walking rapidly with a spear in his right hand, okay, and the sickle in his left hand. We already knew that was a sickle, thanks to Dora finding it for us. <laughs> okay, he gathers in the harvest of souls, and he shepherds them like a flock. Okay, now... The ancient Zodiac called him the anointed shepherd, the guardian and shepherd of the flocks. And they, they in ancient Egyptian, the name was Smat or Smat, S-M-A-T. And it meant one who rules, subdues, and governs. Okay. One who rules, subdues, and governs. So he's a ruler, he's going to subdue the enemy, and he's going to govern his people. This is all what we see that the coming one will do. He will be uh, the, the shepherd, the anointed shepherd that the ancient Zodiac called him. He will be the guardian and the shepherd of the flocks. We are his sheep. You know, we, we know that now, and there will be more sheep by the time he comes to the second coming. He also can be known as the herdsman, H-E-R-D-S-M-A-N, you know, as in herding, you know, a flock of sheep, okay? It comes out of the Hebrew, the booties, maybe I should say bodies, that would make you think B-O-A-T and why I didn't, but the Hebrew word bo means to come. So again, it's the one who's coming who is going to do all this, and we're going to talk about the sickle still too, but with that um, spear that he's got, he's, look, he's showing himself to be guardian, shepherd-like, we'll see it's like a rod, but let me take you first to this, the scripture for the one coming, let me take you to Psalm 96, Psalm 96 verses 12 and 13, and we read here, may the field be jubilant and all that is in it, then all the trees of the forest will sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He will judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. So here comes this coming one. And remember here, because as we go through this description, you'll see he's coming to judge the earth. He's coming to judge the world in righteousness. That's righteous judging. That's not false or unfair. And he's coming to judge the peoples with his faithfulness. You'll go, well, we won't, but the people who will go before him as a judge will get the right 
sentence or freedom, you know, because it's all going to be done righteously. Okay, that's Psalm or Tehillim 96 verses 12 and 13. Now, they think that this probably was the ancient name Arcturus from the Greek that we read about in Job 9 and verse 9, Arcturus, A-R-C-T-U-R-U-S. And they, they give that because that ancient Greek name Arcturus means he comes or he cometh. Okay? And in the, the knee, the bright star in the knee that you can see, that's the, that star. That's Arcturus. That's the meaning he comes. So stars in him means he comes. The, the position he's in, it, he's coming. Um, now we're going to look at that, that spear and the star in the, the head of the spear you can see a fuzzy word right there. It doesn't spell it out well to you, and I'm not even going to try to try to spell it. I'll say it al katurapa al katurapa I practice this in my head. When I try to do it out loud, <laughs> it loses something. But anyway, that star means the branch treading underfoot. Now, what does that remind you of? Does it remind you of the branch from Virgo? and the branch was the name of the Messiah. So now, this one is treading underfoot. What's he treading underfoot? The enemy. He's putting down our enemies. The enemies will be under his feet. Um, we're still on boots. Right? We're still on, yeah, boots or booties or, or boaties or however you want to say it, yes. So he's treading down the enemies. Tre treading underfoot, the oh, enemies, treading. yes. And then again, they'll sometimes call that spear a rod and they connect it with the shepherd's crooks that they always had to help, you know, with their sheep. And we know that in Hebrews 13, 20, our Messiah, this one who will tread our enemies underfoot, is also described as the great shepherd. Hebrews 13, 20. Now may the God of peace who brought up from the dead, one who's come back from the dead, the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant that is Jesus our Lord. So Hebrews 13, 20 <clears throat> refers to him as being the great shepherd, and he came up out of the dead. He, he's, we know this is um, picturing his first coming when he died on the cross for us. Okay. Now, keeping that in mind, go to Revelation 22. We're going to look at, at verses 12 and 20. Revelation 22, verse 12 says, Behold, Lord Jesus speaking, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to reward each one as his work deserves. And verse 20 tells us, He who testifies to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. What does he look like he's doing? Remember, he's walking rapidly. He's coming quickly. He's coming quickly. And this one who is coming quickly, we just read, in verse 12, he has his reward with him to reward those as they deserve. That righteous judging that we talked about also, all seen in booties. Okay? Now, there's another star below the waist on the right side, and that's named Mirak, M I R A C. That means coming forth as an arrow, or it might be the name Mizar, meaning the preserver and guardian. Okay, so we don't know whether it's showing him as guarding his sheep or coming forth with the arrow to, I would say, kill the enemy because we know, you know, he does either. So either name, whichever it is, still portrays him as he comes in that first coming to take care of our enemies for us and to bring us in. You know, he even referred to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, and we know at that time the Gentiles would cross like into Judaism, so they would be in that sheepfold. But um, it's referred to, and he talked about the 90 and 9, that he'd leave in the fold and go look for the one lost sheep. So we know, you know, he showed, he talked much about being the shepherd and uh, bringing them together, guarding, bringing them together, providing for them. There's another star in the left leg, Mufridi or Mufrid or however you want to call it, and that means who separates. Now, when he comes, and he comes, the enemy's been put down, he's going to come in his second coming. We're going to see then that he separates the sheep from the goats. The sheep will go into the kingdom, the goats will be cast out because they were not of him. 
So he is one who will separate. That's Matthew 25, verses 31 to 33. We've still got a star to look at in his head. It's called Nikar, and it means the pierced. So this one who is doing all this has also himself been pierced. This is speaking of the piercing in the head. We know at the crucifixion they put a crown of thorns on his head that pierced his head. And we know from Zechariah, Zechariah chapter 12 and verse 10, I will pour out on the house of David, on the inhabitants of Jerusalem, the spirit of grace and pleading, so they will look at me, God speaking, but they'll look at me, whom they have pierced. And we said, when was God pierced? We know he was pierced when he was crucified on the cross, in his flesh, when we call him Jesus. They'll mourn for him like one mourning for the only son, weeping bitterly over him like the bitter weeping over a firstborn, when they realize, wow, he was our firstborn, and we passed him up. We didn't realize. And what was the reference? Yeah. Zechariah yeah. chapter 12 and verse 10. 12, 10. Yes. Thank you. And it's a great one to show the triunity of our God. God speaking, pouring out the Spirit, and he was pierced. There's Jesus. So we see all three in that one verse. Great verse, especially for our Jewish people. Okay, the Hebrew also has another name for the, that star. They, they call it Merga, M-E-R-G-A, um, where the other one called it Nikar. That was probably either Egyptian or Arabic. You know, I, sometimes I know what, what languages are coming from and sometimes I don't. But the Hebrew being Merga means who bruises. And as soon as we see who bruises, we're right back to Genesis 3.15, where it says that, that Satan would bruise his heel that he would bruise, as in crush, his head, and then he would be dead. So, in our first chapter, our first Virgo, with our first three little ones, um, Kama, Centaurus, and Booties, or however I should say this, we get the whole seed plot. We get the whole volume. We start with our promised seed of Genesis 3.15, and yet we looked all the way to the great judge, the harvester, the, oh, we didn't talk about the sickle. The sickle is harvesting. We know that when he comes, he comes, he puts in his sickle to harvest the earth. He, he treads the wine press. You know, we, we know all that Revelation 16 and other places as we follow to the end of Revelation. So we see in this, in these three, all the way from the promised seed, the virgin birth of the child to the come, one who comes back as judge as harvester to reap the, the harvest of the earth, to bring his flock in, separating the sheep from the goats, to have those who go into the kingdom with him ruling righteously. All of that under the sign Virgo. Amazing? Are you impressed? I am. A wow is what I say. And we've only done one. We've only done the first chapter. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so the promised seed, the seed of the woman. Oh, and also, remember also we saw with that um, that she had the branch in her hand and we saw the branch being the Messianic title. We saw a comet was the desire of all the nations. Centaurus, we saw his two natures, that he's fully God and he's fully man. And then we see him walking with the branch, coming to rule the anointed shepherd. He has his rod, he separates, and he bruises the head of Satan. Wow. I, picture after picture after picture after picture. Is that not awesome and amazing? The detail that we get in God's Word. So um, I can't see faces up there, but I hope you're all, I'm, I'm looking at my audience here and they're loving it. <laughs> Are we good? Is it exciting? Is it amazing? Is it mind-blowing? <laughs> well, we've gone through one twelfth. <laughs> Just wait till you've got 12 of, 12 of these. <laughs> I may not be able to talk, but I'll get us there one way or another. So, okay. Um, and we're ready. I think we can go right into the sign of Libra. So, well, let me ask first, are there any questions? Too many. Yeah, Anne, go ahead. Too many. <laughs> Write Too them many down. Questions. Write them down, Pam. Too many questions. You know, if it's, it's a lot to take in. It is a lot, and if it's overwhelming you, um, I do keep reviewing. I'll encourage you to go back over your notes and review, but I have noticed that I catch on a little better now than I did at the start of the study. Mm -hmm. So hang in here with me, and I think things will begin to make more sense. This is also going up on YouTube, correct? 
it is going up on YouTube to the bit.ly site. You can go listen over and over. If you need a CD, I can make you a CD. I just need to know so that I do that, which reminds me, Roger, we got to do it for somebody in the desert. Don't let me forget. Okay, and your question. I just want to ask real quick. Uh, it's comma, com, comma, Centaurus. What was the second one? The second one is Centaurus. The third one is Booties. B-O-O-T-E-S. Thank you. Or probably something like bo a t t t s you know. I mean, I'm sure I'm slaughtering the names. I'm not here to give you ancient language. Um, you know, I'm not here to teach you the language. <laughs> Just, I'll give you the meanings. <laughs> okay? Any other questions, comments? Okay. It is a lot, but I'm going to go ahead because we've got the time and take us into Libra. Libra will be our second main out of the 12, um, but we'll see three little ones under it also, okay? So you, you, you catch on to that. One big major, three minor. This is chapter two, okay? Chapter one, what did I title chapter one? The, whoops, where did I put it? Okay, I can almost say it, but I want to say it right. I don't want to confuse you again. And I mixed up all my notes. 13, okay. <laughs> I'll have it in a minute. I've got two sets of notes here, and, and I'm messing them up. Here we go. Okay, the first book is The Redeemer, His First Coming. Okay, and the first chapter, chapter 1, was the prophecy of the promised seed of the woman. That was chapter 1. Libra is chapter 2. We're still in the first book, The Redeemer, His First Coming. Chapter 2, The Redeemer's Atoning Work. That's what Libra is going to show us. So all of you who know Libra from astrological, horoscope, and all that, throw that all in the trash can, put the lid on it, and burn it, okay? <laughs> Get rid of it. The Libra sign is to show us the Redeemer's atoning work, how he atones for us, okay? We're going to see the person, the work, and the triumph of the Redeemer. Okay? If you're looking, it's, it's the one that looks like the scales. No, trying to find um, it's number two. Vir, Virgo, keep coming oh, down, keep true. coming down, because we're going this way, right there. Right? The dark one, this, it looks like two oval circles. Yeah, that's Libra. That's a, it's scales. Two kidneys. That's what I think. Okay. Anne and Pam thought it's two kidneys. <laughs> yeah, see the bar across the top? Oh, do I have it? Yeah. Okay, this type of scale. Can we get that oh, up close? That yeah, that's what Libra is, the scales. Okay. 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 And what was boot? Booties was the one that, that looks like a man walking rapidly with a spear in one hand and a sickle in the other. Mm -hmm. was what was oh, he looks like a man with a spear and a sickle. And a sickle, I got that. Yeah. Yeah. But, but what was okay. his, uh, I mean, I don't know, Boot, and whose birthday is in Boot? Oh, okay, <laughs> Booties is under Virgo, it's so under it's under Virgo, Virgo. Oh. yeah, so it, it's the sign of Virgo that so has Booties. So it's Virgo too, so we, yeah. two we have Virgo's the main one, okay, we have 12 main ones, Virgo, Libra, um, did I take it back from you? Scorpio. Somebody, thank Scorpion. You. Okay, Scorpio. And then go to number four. Sagittarius. Sagittarius. Capricorn. Capricorn. Aquarius. I'm sorry. Thank you. That's okay. Um, okay, Aquarius. What Pisces. Pisces. <laughs> Look at who knows here. Aries. <laughs> Aries. Uh, Cancer. <laughs> and Leo. <laughs> Thank you anyway. And I, yeah, I know what you're I trying to do. Yeah. Well, you okay. Missed, you missed Taurus. Oh, I miss Taurus. Taurus. And then I, and then Cancer and Leo. Okay. Yeah. Those are our, our main 12. <laughs> we'll get Medina to teach that. <laughs> okay. Those are the main 12. We're all familiar with those names, so are pretty familiar. Those are those major zodiac signs that, that are the same all around, okay? Under each sign is three little ones, three uh, decons, three okay. small constellations. Um, if I did, all I can think of as an outline in my mind, I would do number one, Virgo. Then A, B, and C would be um, the three, that, the little ones that we just talked about. Um, 
<laughs> yeah. Commas, booties. Comma, uh, centaurus, and booties. That would be A, B, and C. Under number one. Okay? Under number one. So under Virgo is, yes, is comma, is, um, and then booties. Centaurus, and then booties. Okay? Now, another way to look at it is like a book. Okay? Chapter one in your book is Virgo. In chapter one, you went through three subtopics, okay? Those subtopics are the three we just named. Now we're doing chapter number two. Chapter number two is Libra. It's the scales. Everybody knows that is the picture, just like Virgo is the virgin. Okay, and that isn't what this is. This, this is the type of scales, but this is talking about um, in Israel when they... they the way. Okay. It's the scales of justice. They, it is the scales of justice. They're shown on the courthouse. Yes, shown on the courthouse. And we're going to see, we're going to be talking about the, the, um, the balance. We're going to talk about it right away in the beginning. So hold on just one second and I'll show you how the scales refer to the justice of God. Okay, instead of the justice of our courthouse, instead of the justice, even when you, in, in the markets, you'll still see them weigh on the scale to know how much of a product to give you. You know, you see scales like that where they have one side already weighted out. This is a pound. So when the scales are even, you've got a pound of this. You know, obviously, if it's a pound of, um, what am I going to say, dates, it would be lighter than if it was a pound of rocks, okay? I'm, I'm crossing lines here, but you get the idea, so. Um, is it a pound, a pound? A okay. pound is a pound, but you may get this much dense, oh, and you may okay. get that few gotcha. rocks. Means they're, they're less yeah. dense. Gotcha. You mean they're less, less dense. dense. Thank you. Thank you. My brain went out to lunch today. Thank you, Medina. What's the word you use? Less dense. Less dense. D-E-N-S-E. Yeah, the scales are going to show you, you're going to get a pound, but you get a lot more something that's less dense than, than something. We don't buy it this way, but silk and denim. Silk is very light. You would get a lot of silk. Denim, you get less because it's, it's heavier. Or a pound of feathers. Pound of feathers, good. This, good. See, this is our what physics what teacher. We need a <laughs> physics <laughs> lesson right now. <laughs> <laughs> pound of feathers or pound of feathers? Weigh. Right. What weighs more, a pound of feathers or a pound of gold? Neither. They yeah. weigh the same. Right. <laughs> but you're going to get one little cold brick, you and you're going to get a whole lot of feathers. Yeah, well, that's what we're trying okay. to say. Okay. That's the type of scales we're looking at. But here we go now. Okay. This is chapter two. We've closed Virgo. We are opening Libra, and it, as I said, is the Redeemer's atoning work. It's the person, the work, and the triumph of the Redeemer. He's the one that's going to atone, okay? The decons, I'm just going to give you the names, but we're going to look at Libra first. The decons are Crux, C-R-U-X, and I'll, I'll have a whiteboard up next week, or I'll get this out to you somehow. The second one is lupus or victima. Remember when um, our Centaurus, our godman, had the spear going to the upside down, looked like a, an animal? John, that's lupus. That okay? Scared. Yeah. That's lupus or victima. The victim. Yeah, the victim. Oh. And then corona is the third one. We're going to look at all of those, but right now we're going to just start with Libra. We're going to start with the scales, okay? Now, the scales, when we're talking about God's astronomy, are God's justice. So this is the justice of God, okay? We're going to see that the price was deficient. There was not enough to pay the price. But we're going to see God balances it so that the price will cover what it's to cover, okay? So the, it was weighed out and it was found wanting. Remember that, that description? Mm -hmm. Okay, you didn't have enough. You remember who? You remember who? Yeah. Okay. This is back in Daniel's oh, day. Daniel. This was the the um, one that that uh, he asked Daniel uh, Belshazzar. Thank you. <laughs> he asked Daniel to interpret, you know, his what the handwriting on the wall meant, mm -hmm. and he right. said, you you know, the scales you've been found wanting. You don't have enough. You, what's going to be required of you is your life. You won't make it through the night, and he did not. 
the enemy was already infiltrating under the gates because they dried up the moat, the, the water, the whatever it was, river or whatever, and they were already coming underneath without a an arrow being shot. They took over, they took control, and Belshazzar was out, just like God had said. Um, I think that's Daniel 5.27. Where was Daniel during that party time? Was he at home? <laughs> um, he, I'm sure he probably went back to his home because he wouldn't have taken part in the party. And he didn't care about the reward that was supposed to be his, a third of the kingdom. Well, what good is that when the kingdom's going to be taken from <laughs> you tonight? <laughs> so, gonna be yeah, yeah. Your um, flashlight's still on. I don't know if you mean for it to be or not. Uh, I'm sorry, I can't see the that. Oh, is that's it, fine. Is that's it fine. In Not when I don't look right at you, and it's fine. I just didn't know if you oh, forgot. I'm sorry. No, no, no. It's good. Daniel five twenty seven. The word in Hebrew is tekel, T E K E L. You have been found. You have been weighed on the scales and found oh, deficient. Wow. Okay. So he's a good example for us. Belshazzar was found deficient. What chapter? Daniel five twenty seven. Okay, so if he's been found deficient, he's found wanting. He doesn't have enough. He can't pay the price that, that he owes for his life. His life is going to be required of him. We also see in Eov, in the book of Job, chapter uh, 6 and verse 2, it says, Oh, if only my grief were actually weighed and laid in the balances together with my disaster. He, he was begging for things to be weighed out for a justice in his life. But he was saying even if it happened, it'd be so heavy, it'd be heavier than the sands of the sea. This is when he's headed down to woe is me. It's, it's, you know, woe is the day that they told my mother a male child had been born to her, you know, because he was so depressed from his suffering. Okay? Was well, so, that 28, that, that one P-E-R, E-S, is that also part Perez, of that? Perez, that's part of that, yeah. Yeah, you're in the verse 28. Yeah, the prophecy, there were three parts of the prophecy, but the one that I focused on is the scales rather than the other two. When we were in Daniel, we went through all three. Today, we'll just look at the scales, okay? <laughs> it's enough for us to absorb this. So, once again, Libra is the scales in the justice of God. The price was deficient. The balance, it'll be balanced by the price which will cover so it would be like you came up to pay and you were a dollar short and somebody behind you said, here, I'll put the dollar in for you. Now you've paid, you're, you're, you're good, and you get to go. Okay? That's the idea. All right? Now, even though you can't see it on the map that well, the stars that are in it, the, well, the overall name first, the Hebrew name for, for Libra is Mosanium. I'm trying. And it simply means the scales or weighing. And when I say weighing, I mean like weighing on a scale. Okay? That's the Hebrew name. The Latin name gives us Libra. That's where Libra comes from. And it also means weighing. And the Arabic name, which I cannot pronounce, says it means purchase or redemption. Okay? And redemption, we know that that's redeeming something. Something that's been lost that's going to be redeemed. So obviously it was a price lacking. Now in Libra itself there are two bright stars. One's called Zubin el Ganubi. <laughs> it's called Chaser in Hebrew. It means lacking or in want of and it's on the lower scale. And if you look really hard the scale on the left is, is the one that's lower. Okay, it's just kind of hard to see it because we don't have a 3D map here, but that's what it's, it's in that side, okay? Needy, lacking, and want of. Um, it goes with the part where the price, which is deficit, the price isn't enough, the purchase price isn't enough. Let me take you to Psalm 62 and verse 9. Psalm 62 and verse 9. And in Psalm 62, 9, we have people of low standing are only breath. People of rank are light. In the balances, they go up. Together, they are lighter than breath. Okay, so he, he's saying that, that even people, you can't balance. You've got people with low rank. You've got people that, that have a bad rank. In the balances, they all are going to go up, and they're all going to be found wanting. They're not, no one's going to have enough 
to pay the price for themselves. Romans 6.23 tells us that. This have to do with starvation? It, I would, it, she's asking me, does it have to do with starvation? It doesn't have to be starvation. It could be um, more than that. In my mind, what it has to do with is your soul is going to be required of you. When you stand before a God who is going to deal justly with you, you in yourself have no ability to pay the price in full. You're deficit. So for me, it's not starvation. It's your whole life. You're going to stand before God. You're lacking. What are you going to say to God? If God were to say to you, why should I let you into my heaven? What could you say to him? Oh, I did a hundred good works. I, I, I did such good works. And someone comes along and says, well, wait a minute, God. I did a thousand good works, so her hundred, she's out, I'm in. And it goes on and it goes on. You can't stand in your works. You can't stand in, I righted somebody's wrong. You know, I, I made justice for somebody else. You didn't do it, you didn't take care of everything. We are told in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, okay? Wage, that's what we earn. What do we earn? We earn our paycheck, that's our wages. What have we earned? Because we are all sinners, and we're told everyone is a sinner. Anyone who wants to say they're not a sinner, that means that you've lived a perfect life, you've lived it according to God's holy standard, that God has no problem with you. You've never stepped that line, never said a wrong word, never did a wrong thing, never had a wrong thought. You know, take that to the hill. And anybody who has the audacity to think that they're that good, we know they're so full of pride that right there's their sin. <laughs> because pride is a sin. So as soon as I lifts I up, I goes down <laughs> and, and falls. So the wage, what we've earned for our sin is death. That's the price we've got to pay. So when we come up to the scales of justice, we're found wanting. We've got to give our life to, to cover the, the cost. And even that's just bringing us death. We, we die. But we're going to see we're not left there. The rest of Romans 6.23 we know says, but the gift of God is eternal life. That means that, that in place of death, we get life. And it's gifted to us. And what is that gift of eternal life? Through Jesus Christ our Lord. How is it through him? It's through his blood. His blood that was put in our place because Leviticus 17 tells us that the life of the flesh is in the blood. The blood's been put on the altar for the forgiveness of sin. Without the shedding of blood, there's not remission for sin according to scripture. So we see that our gift is Jesus' blood. When that blood is put on that scale with us, now instead of being deficit, we're going to see it bounces out. And now we're, we gain life. Okay, that's what our scale is showing us. Um, I think I read to you those verses. Okay, so man's found, man, man is weighed in the balance. Stand on the scale. None of us like the scale. <laughs> but stand on that scale and you're found wanting. But remember the rest of it said, it's balanced by the price which covers. So Yeshua Jesus covers what we owe. He makes up for where we're deficit. And how does he do it? He pays the whole price. He doesn't come in and pay the dollar you're short. He doesn't come in and make the difference. He comes in and wipes out all of your sin so that you are seen as holy before God now. We're going to look at 1 Peter. 1 Kepa in Hebrew. 1 Peter. Oh. And we're going to look at First Peter chapter one. What'd you say, Anne? I like when you repeat it. Yes. That's my it. I, I know, I know. And believe me, when I'm studying I have to do the same thing. That's why I do repeat verses and, and all that, because we all need to hear it again and again. Our minds are going on so much we can't catch it all. So first Peter one, verses eighteen and nineteen. Verse 18, knowing you were not redeemed with perishable things like silver and gold from your futile way of life that you inherited from your forefathers. All you could get from passed down to you, silver and gold. Well, silver and gold are not there forever. You know, we, gold's about the highest. And they perish. But they perish. They perish. And up in heaven, we know gold 
is on under our feet. We're going to walk on it. So that tells you how valuable gold is. Remember my little story, and if you've heard it before, sorry, you got to hear it again. Give me my people, if, um, Roger, please, so that I can see faces. If you heard it, I apologize. But this man makes a deal with God. He's just so intent that he's got something of such great value that he finally gets God to say, okay, when you die and you come to heaven, you get to bring one suitcase. So pack it carefully because that's all you're going to get to bring in. So, of course, the story goes, he dies, he's met by Peter at the gate. You know, there is no such thing, but this is our story. Okay, <laughs> Peter at the gate says, oh, Leave the suitcase outside. You can come in. You're on the list. You get to come in, but your suitcase has to stay out. Oh, no, 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 no. I got special permission ahead of time. God says I get to bring one suitcase in. Well, Peter just adamantly, no, there's no way. This is not right. He says, you go ask God because God told me. So Peter sends an angel down to God. God sends a message back to the angel. Yep, I made an exception. He gets to bring in one suitcase. Well, by this time, all of heaven's in a hubbub. There's the, he's, a human's bringing something into heaven. What is this that he's bringing in? We got to see what this is. It must be something spectacular if, if, if he's wanting to bring it to heaven because heaven's so spectacular. What could he possibly be wanting to bring? So Peter opens up the gate, the suitcase and the man come in, and Peter says, Okay, open it up, open it up. We all want to see what you brought. And he opens it up and he's put all his gold bricks, put everything he had of value, bought gold bricks and he put gold bricks in the suitcase and he brought his gold bricks into heaven. And Peter looks up at him and says, Asphalt? You brought asphalt? <laughs> Our best is dust under our feet in heaven if there's such a thing as dust, okay, in heaven. So, so that was First Peter what? First Peter one. I ha I haven't gotten all the way through it yet. First Peter one eighteen and nineteen. So we're not bought by perishable things, things that can't last. There is nothing. We can't do it by our works. We can't do it by the family we were born into. We can't say, well, you know, God. Hey, I'm of the Jewish line. I can go all the way back. I researched my genealogy. Do you know I found Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob? I found all the great prophets. They were in my line. I got good genes, God. You know, that's going to get me up. No, it doesn't matter what family you're born to. It doesn't matter what country you're born to. Do you know how many people live in America and think that means they're a Christian? And they will tell you that. And I will not give names and I won't say the, the relation too closely, but in my past, um, the younger brother of the one that I knew had just signed up for military and he came home to ask his mom and dad a question. They want to know what religion I am on my dog tags. I didn't know what to tell them. What am I? <laughs> and the answer came back, well, you're Christian. You're born in America. The old saying goes, you're Protestant. That's what they always tell Well, they told him to go back and tell them Christian. My point being, Christian literally means a follower of Messiah, because Christ is the Greek word for Hebrew word Messiah. Okay, oh, okay. so if you are following the Messiah, then you can use that term. But if you're not following him, he's not your Lord, he's not your Savior, he's not your the one that, that, that you're answering to, and you don't have him in your life because you've invited him in for that forgiveness of sins, and you can't call yourself a Christian. I don't care where you were born. It doesn't matter where. Even you can be born in the Holy Land. Christian. Yes. They call themselves yes. Christians. Right, and they're not. And they're not. You can go be born in Israel. Well, I was born in Bethlehem, right where you were born, Jesus. Doesn't that count? <laughs> it doesn't matter what we come up with. This is telling us everything's perishable. Everything's futile, even if you've inherited it from your forefathers. And then it gives us the great but. Here's your exception. All that perishes, verse 19, but with precious blood. As of a lamb unblemished and unspotless, I'm sorry, and spotless, <laughs> the blood of Messiah, the blood of Christ, the blood Yeshua Jesus shed on the cross. That's what we've been bought with. So when we were put on that scale and it was tipped against us, we came up short, 
the Lord took his blood and put his blood on the other scale and it balanced. It covered, it actually washed away all of our sin. And that's why he paid the price. He paid it with his own life. <clears throat> because he did live perfectly, holy, his blood was not the wage of sin. So it could freely be in our place. And that's how we get the precious blood of the Lord that, that balances our lives. Okay, so in the scales, I told you in the lower scale, now in the upper scale, there's a bright star, and it also is Zubin El, sorry, Zubin Al Kamali. <laughs> Shamali, I don't know. It means the price which covers. So we see that we understand the, the meaning of these symbols by the stars and what those names mean, okay? Just below the scales, towards Centaurus, which you're seeing the top of him here. Centaurus, remember, is our god man. Just below the scales, towards Centaurus, is Zubin Akrabi, or Zubin al Karab, And that means the price of the conflict. Uh-oh, there was a conflict. Let's go to Revelation 5 and verse 9. Let's see what we're going to find out about that conflict. Revelation 5 and verse 9. Revelation 5 verse 9 says, and they sang a new song, okay? Let me, let me take you back. Um, you see in verse 6, between the throne and the elders, a lamb standing as if he'd been slaughtered. It gives a description of the lamb. He takes the scroll out of the one sitting on the throne in verse 7. When he'd taken the scroll in verse 8, the four living creatures, the 24 elders, all fall below, down before the lamb. They have bowls full of incense, which is the prayers of the saints. And these are those who have fallen and worshiped before the Lord. Um, this one, this lamb who is by the one who's sitting on the throne, who we know is God, they sing the new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to break its seals. Okay, he's not found deficit. He's not found wanting. Worthy are you, for you were slaughtered, and you purchased people for God with your blood. From every tribe, every language, every people, every nation. So how does a Chinese get saved? The same way a Jew gets saved. How does a Jew get saved? The same way a Korean gets saved. Put in any nationality, Swedish, Irish, English, whatever you want in there, we're all saved. If we're saved, it's by the purchased blood of Yeshua, Jesus. Amen. That's what we're saying. Amen and amen. So the price of the conflict, there's a conflict, and that is that we're all found wanting, that we're in need. We deserve that death, and the price to, to, to settle the conflict is shed blood. Uh, John 3, I know you're familiar with verse 16. We'll start there, but 17 is also important for my point here. John 3, Yechanan 3, 16. For God, God the Father, so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Yeshua Jesus, so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life, will not die permanent death, they'll have that eternal life. 4, verse 17, God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world. Okay, he didn't come to judge at this point. He came so that the world might be saved through him. Put his blood on the scale to balance the scales for us. So that is the price that is um, of the conflict and of the price paid is the shed blood. I want to get at least into the first minor constellation underneath because it goes so well with this. We'll see if we can get all three in just a few minutes. If we can't, we're at least going to do this first one. Go right below Centaurus. There you go. You're already showing it in the corner. We're looking at the crux. The crux is the cross. I love this. I love this one. The crux of the cross? The crux, C-R-U-X, is oh, okay. the cross, okay? Crux, C-R-U-X, is Latin meaning cross. Okay. Okay, at least I think it's Latin. It means cross, okay? Yeah. It is made up of five stars. Five is the number of grace in Scripture. For by grace are we saved through faith. Right there, I love it. There's five stars in it. 
you can see one, two, three, it looks almost like six in that picture. But they say that, that the constellation, that they connect the dots, that they form the cross, that there's five stars in it. Remember, I've been telling you, like, some of them had a hundred and some odd stars. The, the crux is small, and it's only five stars in it. Okay? In the, in the cross. In the cross. Five stars. Five stars in the cross. They must, those two others are real tiny. Yes. Oh, okay. yes. Where is it? Um, where all is the way the on your right corner. See the go horse? down below it's the, 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 the man, man horse. The man, below the half God man, man, half horse. Oh, yes, yes. There okay. you go. Oh, there you go. The man, half horse. Right, half horse, half man, the God man, the dual nature that we saw. Okay, um, go ahead and give me my people back so I know if they they have any issues. Is everybody okay? They found it. If they've got a map, they found it. Are you good? You're in the bottom right corner if you didn't find it. Okay, I got a thumbs up. I'm going to go with that. Okay, so this cross is small. It's made up of five stars, five the number of grace. By God's grace, we are saved. It's your faith. The Hebrew name is Adam, okay? Adam means red, or it, it can also mean blood. Um, when Adam was made out of the earth, he, it's still meaning red. The earth, the clay was probably reddish. So there goes your white man theory, your black man theory, and your every other color theory, okay? <laughs> We're not going to get into that anyway. There's one race, and it's the human race. All right. Yeah, so Adam means red. Red is in blood, and we read in Daniel, Daniel chapter 9 and verse 26, what happens to this one, okay? Daniel 9 and verse 26, we read, there it is. Then, after the 62 weeks, what we're into is Daniel's prophecy of 70 weeks. We know the 70 weeks, there was a period of 7, a period of 62, and a one seven-year period still waiting, okay? After the 62 weeks, the 7 have been filled, and now the 62 have been filled, the Messiah will be cut off and have nothing, and the people of princes to come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. Okay, where it says Messiah will be cut off, that's violent cut off in the Hebrew. That's blood. That's a cutting. That's red. That's all. It all is referring into the same thing. Now, it's interesting to note. Is that a question, Maria? It's a question. Coming up. Okay. Uh, yeah, I, I wanted to know. You, you said that it was Daniel one twenty six. Nine. Daniel nine oh, twenty six. Okay. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I heard one. I said, no, it doesn't have 26. <laughs> okay, yeah, thank yeah. you. Sure, sure. It's his 70 weeks of Daniel. This starts with verse 24 and goes to 27. But we just looked at the part, verse 26, where it's talking about the blood, the cutting off, the violent death. Okay? Now, the last letter of the Hebrew all of faith, Hebrew alphabet, is a letter called Tav. Tav in ancient Hebrew was the shape of a cross. Not the perfect, it's got a little bend to it, but it's still, everybody says it's a cross. And it meant a mark, especially a boundary mark or a limit or a finish. Being the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet, it gave that idea of the finish. So when they look at the top, the shape of the cross from the ancient Hebrew, they're saying the cross means the end. It's signifying it's finished. Okay? As soon as I hear myself say that, I hear the Greek words, tetelestai. When Yeshua Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. It's the end. It's done. It's complete. That's tetelestai in Greek. That meant the purchase price was paid in full. It was stamped, paid in full. If you had a debt, you wanted that stamp on your paperwork that said tetelestai. You can never be held responsible for that debt again. Do you see how that all fits in with everything we've just said? The redemption price, the blood, no longer found deficit. The scales have been balanced. Yeshua Jesus gave his all to do it. He died on the cross, the significant end. The wages of our sin, that is death, is swallowed up in the cross, which gives us victory. So, and we also see in the shape of the, the letter HET today, um, 
and I did this with you with Passover. When they put the blood on the, the doorpost, it formed the hip, which is the gateway, the doorway in, and we say it's the doorway to the heart. When you apply the blood to the heart, you've opened the door to your gift of salvation. So we see it in that letter also, um, the Tav and the Chet, again, the Tav in ancient Hebrew and the Chet in, um, in, in modern, or more modern, not the very ancient Hebrew. And it's interesting that the Chet also to the, the Hebrew mind is standing for life because Chai is a word for life that comes from the letter Chet. So how do we get life out of death through the doorway of opening our heart to the blood that Yeshua shed on the cross to pay the price in full so that it is finished? I love crux. I think that right now it's, it, well, they're all great, but that's one of my favorite is constellations. Is that the second phrase under Libra? The, the that's, cross, the cross. Because we did the cross in another one too. We did the cross in the, uh, the first one too. Not the crux, no. We didn't do the, the crux in the first one. Well, that that no cross, sign. no. We, in the first one under Virgo, we looked at the God man above the cross. Oh. But we didn't talk about the cross. The cross belongs to Libra. Oh, okay. Okay. I got him down in both places. Oh, okay. Well, he so belongs. In Libra. He belongs in Libra. Libra only. He, okay. it, whatever well, I should phrase it, belongs in Libra. Okay. I'm going to just finish the cross because of the time. We'll get the other two that go under Libra next time. And I'll try to get papers out to you where you can see these. I think maybe if I have something written for you, if you're like me, you're better through the eyes than the ears. So that may help. Okay. It's called the Southern Cross because it's seen near the south. You can see that it's the, the, the south. It's south of the equator and it's only in the southern hemisphere. The northern hemisphere never sees the crux. It's only in the, the, the southern hemisphere. It used to be seen in our hemisphere, but with the gradual shifting of the heavens, it sank enough southward that the last time it was seen in the horizon of Jerusalem, was about the time that Messiah was crucified. Is that not fascinating? That blew me away. Show me my people, <laughs> please. <laughs> I look up to see people and I see my map. Um, is that not a mind blower? Is that not God's detail? I, I just, I love that. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 8. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Messiah, Christ, Jesus, who, as he already existed in the form of God, the one who was, did not consider it equal with God something to be grasped. He was willing to let go of his equality with God, emptied himself by taking on the form of a bondservant, that's the form, well, and being born in the likeness of man. He came as a man but he didn't come as king man, he came as servant. Being found in the appearance of man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death. He came to die. How many of you were born that all you wanted to do from the day you were born was fulfill your purpose, which is to die? No, we think about our life. What's my purpose for my life? He came to die. Being found in the appearance of man, humble himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him. The servant is brought up. He is not left down in servant position. Bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, the name of Yeshua, every knee will bow. Give and every tongue confess. Jesus You've got it. Lord. You've got it. You all read in verse 11. I was going to stop it. You got it. And it's to the glory of God the Father. And who's the glory of God? Yeshua Jesus. So we see him as servant. We see him suffering. We see his death. But we see him exalted, brought up, and in his glory, where every knee will bow. They will realize whether they believed and accepted or whether they rejected, they will realize who he is. And uh, the last point to bring out for crux, for our cross, 
is it's in Centaurus's path. Remember the godman that's right over? It's in that path. The despised, remember that's what Centaurus meant, the despised godman is positioned just over the cross like he's straddling the cross. He came to die. But remember, he's shooting his arrow. He's conquering the enemy, which is death. He brings us life. That's the crux. You might say that's the <laughs> crux of it all. <laughs> that's the cross. Going back to our audience, we're going to stop there. Next week, we'll continue to look under Libra. We'll look at lupus, which is that victim that, that we're seeing being, being um, put down. And we will look at um, Corona. Okay? So um, those are the next two. Corona is the crown. It's very, very small, but when you look for the crown, so we're going to see a whole lot of symbolism. Right here in the middle? Yes. Yes. Tiny little crown. Tiny little crown, yes. So um, Libra has some of the smallest, but it's got some of the, the wows already in it. So, um, yeah, but it, again, and we're always going to see every time when the negative or the death or something like that, bless you, is brought out, we're going to see the victory, the resurrection, the life brought out also. It's like God always completed the story. He never left us in that deficit position. We've got an amazing study going on, and we have just begun. <laughs> so, questions, comments? Sorry for how warm it is here in the house. If it's, it's 94 fine. next week, oh, okay, maybe it was just me. I was going to say we'll put on air. <laughs>